today I would base uh, I will talk about uh, sorry I will talk about uh, a, a few work that sh should uh, come out uh, before the end of the year and let me I would like to just introduce a little bit the uh, the collaborator so uh, of course Laurentio uh, I think most of you know uh, Li Wei who was a graduate student here a, a graduate student but he's now doing his PhD in Northeastern and I, I would also like to introduce these two fantastic undergraduate students uh, uh, Li Yuanjiang and He Chengwen who will uh, be applying for PhD program abroad next year so uh, after Yesterday, I think we're, we're very convinced. Uh, we've seen a lot of talks that talked about the unitarity and causality, which imposes strong constraint on, on EFT. And at the current stage, we can both numerically, I would like to emphasize that we can both numerically and analytically uh, carve out the EFT space. And in, in cases where we can do this, uh, basically the two approaches match. So one uh, example is the skip, for example, the scalar EFT, uh, where uh, we, by doing analytic carving, we know the boundary, the analytic form of the boundary of this space, and uh, it matches uh, with uh, the numerical SDP uh, semi-definite programming approach. Uh, basically, in drawing this kind of uh, uh, EFT space, uh, in semi-definite programming, what, what it does is it, it maximizes the coupling one at a time. So first, it maximizes along a one-dimension direction, and then for the second uh, direction, uh, it fix the particular coupling and maximize and minimize the other direction. Whereas the analytic approach basically gives you the boundary, uh, it gives you the boundary directly in terms of uh, inequalities and it just directly it gives you the, the, the space. Now, if we compare the two, uh, actually, uh, to be honest, uh, so in general, in general, semi-definite program is much faster. So even if we give you the analytic expression of the of, of the inequalities of the boundaries, uh, if you just compare to running time with respect to SDP, SDP is much faster. So if a numerics is faster, then why bother with analytics? Well, uh, there's a few uh, points that I like to make. First is that uh, given the definition of the space, which by that, I mean that given the analytic boundaries, there's then we can have other numerical approach. So for example, many of the plots that we've been doing uh, recently has been using other methods where we just give the analytic boundaries and for now you can implement other numerical methods, for example, interior point methods, which is well developed uh, before. And the other is that one of the most, one of the uh, highlights of this talk is that since we're studying the geometry, uh, of the space uh, analytically, then we can now introduce bounds where we're bounding the partial wave coefficients from above. So most of the recent bounds that have been derived are basically just imp imposing unitarity and then the partial wave, the imaginary part of the partial wave uh, is positive. We know that it's not just positive, but it's actually bounded uh, from above as well. So how do we implement this bound? And because we know that the, the, what the space looks like, uh, or we know how to describe the space analytically, we can incorporate this uh, upper bound into our space, uh, as you'll see. And finally, of course, because the geometry is, a, is actually a, pr a pretty interesting mathematical problem. So it's really fun to explore. Now, uh, so we're going, what, what I'm going to do is in this talk is I'm going to do a hybrid version. So I'm going to do both talk about numerical results and 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 and, and how we approach uh, the, this problem analytically. So I, I think I don't need to go through the derivation of various dispersion relation. So in this talk, we're going to talk, we're going to focus on gravity amplitude, and we're going to utilize the dispersion relation uh, for all helicity sectors. So we're going to we're going to we write down the dispersion related for all plus the MHV and the single minus. And we're basically just going to see what uh, consistency conditions does this these inequality actually imply. Now, this is uh, here, I'm writing it in this form, but it's exactly the same thing as if you do twice subtracted dispersion. The only difference is just that uh, in this here, the equality here, by equality, I just mean that it's equal in terms of doing uh, Taylor expansion in S and T on both sides. And, and twice um, subtraction here just means that we're, this equality only holds 
uh, for couplings where the, 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 the k minus q, which counts the power of s is bigger or equal to two or zero, it depends on the prefactor of your helicity factor. So, so for different sectors, we have a, a different uh, bound, uh, a, a different uh, lower bound. So, uh, so uh, here, of course, uh, as mentioned yesterday, that uh, these uh, partial wave uh, polynomials are basically uh, Wigner D matrices. Oh, I should mention that some of these results uh, in terms of, in, the, in terms of external photons were already analyzed in this uh, paper uh, earlier this year. So let me just directly flash you some numerical results. So uh, here is, uh, for example, so we can, by solving, by implementing STP on all of these dispersion relations, uh, then we can start to bound our space. So this blue uh, region was, the, so this is, first of all, this is K equals four. So that means D8 R to the four operator uh, normalize. Uh, so there's three different structures here. And so if we're looking at uh, B42 over B40 and B41 over B40. So this blue region uh, was what well, was uh, derived uh, by Zvi, uh, Sasha, and, and Demetrius uh, earlier this year. And but of course, when you write these, 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 uh, the, these uh, equalities out, you have more conditions that you can impose. For example, you have crossing condition relations that relate different helicity uh, configurations. So these are, of course, are just supposed to be related uh, by uh, just relabeling. And if one does that, then uh, the space uh, shrinks to the, the, the this orange region. Uh, so a few comments. So this is, of course, the, the known theories, which was uh, as, as heavily ever advertised sitting on the island of, uh, of, of low spin dominance. So one might ask, so what, how do we, how can we further shrink this space? So one of the interesting things uh, one can look at is since we're doing semi-definite programming, we can look at the spectrum that is actually sitting and let me call this tent pole, which means it's sitting at the maximum and the minimal of each directions. So the, the semi-definite programming will give you uh, basically information about what spectrum are allowed at this place. So in other words, what theories are sitting here and you can see that this, this is a spectrum. So here K uh, just means how many null constraints we've imp implemented. Uh, we only implement up to eight because it's already converging at eight, uh, eight at K equals eight. Um, so, you, 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 so this is the spectrum. So normalized by M gap, sorry, normalized by labeled by spin and M gap. So you notice that the spectrum is basically all the higher spins, so all the even spins. But the, the really the, the, the important point is that, that they're all sitting at one, which means that all of these states have the same mass. So this is an accumulation spectrum. And we, we, we see, we, we find that over and over again, what is really sitting, what is really sitting here in these 10 posts are these accumulation spectrum that are sitting there. So if one would really want to shrink this space further, uh, uh, the question is, uh, what is wrong with these, this kind of uh, configuration? I mean, can we, can we write down uh, uh, an analytic uh, condition which actually rules out this kind of spectrum? So this is just to compare with earlier result uh, uh, at k equals four. So certainly, uh, so this is the, as I mentioned, this is already mentioned yesterday. So there's some overlap, uh, overlap work with, uh, with what Simone did yesterday. And so just to, uh, let's just make two comments. So this is for D4 R to the four uh, with respect to R to the four. So um, notice that in compared to this plot here where the known theories are sitting on the island. So we observe that uh, when you're considering coupling space which involve different derivative order, now the theories get spread out. So it's no longer sitting in a tight corner, it's really spread out in this region now. And we've test for a few other examples. It's generically this case where known theories, when you're talking about uh, coupling space, which are of same derivative order, they're, they're condensed in the island. But whenever you're talking about coupling space, which are different derivative order, then they're uh, actually uh, spread out. And also another invariant feature of this, uh, of this plot is, or of all of these plots, is that all, at all the extremal points, uh, at all the extremal points, for example, here and here on this line, uh, you can see it's always just these accumulation spectrum sitting there at the boundary that is really stretching this uh, space uh, out. 
uh, this is just some, this, we also looked at the, uh, so this is D square R to four and D four R to four plot. The reason that we want to look at this, because here we have non-perturbative information uh, from type two B, where uh, because of S duality, uh, the, the D four R to the four operator and R four operator is actually known at strong coupling. So we can actually scan the space uh, for the strong coupling uh, uh, region. And so as you, as I mentioned before, because these are not equal K, so not equal derivative uh, order, therefore the known theories are not condensed in a small region. They're really, they're more or less spread out. Uh, type 2B that is maximally supersymmetric. So it doesn't have any non-zero B10. So that's why it's sitting at the origin. But on, on this one dimension axis, so the full uh, non-perturbative uh, region is basically just this line here. So this is the perturbative point and the stretches down here as you cover the, the fundamental region. So, the, so um, and finally, uh, for, for example, if you're interested in the all plus, now naively the all plus, uh, amp, the all plus amplitude or all, the all plus couplings uh, don't have a, any convex geometry, just from the simple reason that the dispersion relation is not that positive. Uh, but however, it does have a convex region when you actually normalize it with respect to other couplings or the, 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 the geometries which actually have a positive geometry. So for example, so if I, if I call the all plus to be A coupling, the A coupling normalized to B coupling, which is the MHV sector, uh, actually uh, gives you a finite region here. And it's basically, you can understand this very trivially. This is more or less like Schwartz inequality. So even though A, a dot a, uh, two vectors a dot b is not positive definite, but a dot b is bounded from above uh, by a square and b square. So, so, so that's why you can get this type of bound. Okay, so this is uh, just uh, some. So this is uh, some uh, re recent results that we derived. So, so now I like to. Sorry, sorry Eugene, a quick question. Uh, yes. You, on this plot, you haven't used uh, the partial waves are bounded from above, right? Oh, no, no, all of these are just yeah, right. Yeah, so, all of these are, right. Very so, so very importantly, so all of these are projective bounds. So you, you yeah. see that we, we're bounding things with ratios. Uh, and that's because uh, you, the SDP is set up to do projective bounds. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't impose uh, the, these bounds from above. So now what we like to do is we really like to bound things from above. Now to do this, let me just re-describe this, uh, uh, this space, uh, this EFT space in terms of a geometry. So basically the, the point is that uh, near the four limit, uh, near the four limit, the G, uh, when we expand in S and T, the, G, the, the, the Wilson coefficients uh, are basically, you can re rewrite as some positive thing multiplied by some, uh, some coefficient, which is related to the expansion of your, uh, your partial wave expansion. So this partial wave expansion can be either the gender polynomial or for when you have helicity external state Wigner D matrix, it doesn't matter. So you just have some a coefficient where you're expanding a near the forward limit. Of course, you're also going to have a dependence on the mass uh, order, which comes from expanding in S. So basically what this tells you is that you basically have a convex hall of what is known, what is what I call a product geometry, where you have an expansion in the mass and parameters coming from your polynomial. So not surprisingly, uh, in general, this polynomial is very simple when you write things in terms of J, where J is LL plus one. And if you do a rotation, a nice rotation, then you'll realize that uh, it's just a trivial GL rotation along the, the expansion in, in, in T direction. Then the rotated coupling just becomes a very simple form. It's just a positive sum of moments. So these are just uh, product moments. So the geometry behind this is actually very simple. Uh, and since it's very simple, we already know what the boundaries that are associated with uh, these product moments. So uh, you can understand it very trivially. So let's say if you have some couplings here that are given by a positive sum of a bunch of points on the moment. So that by moment, I mean one X, X square all the way to X D. Then the, 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 the same is equivalent to that your Y, when I organize this into your Henkel matrix, this matrix is positive semi-definite. Okay, to, to see this is very trivial. You can see that this matrix, you can, it's actually written, you can, you can rewrite it as C, uh, the sum of, uh, vectors 
uh, where the vectors are just these x. And since it's, it can be written in this form, that means any two vectors dotted into it is always positive. And therefore, this tells you that from linear algebra, we know that this is positive semi-definite. So depending on where your x take value, uh, if x is just real, at, this is called a hamburger problem, the hamburger problem. And we just know that the, the, the answer is just that uh, the, the determinant of your Hankel matrix or the minor of your leading, uh, the leading principal minors are positive. If X is not just on R, but positive, uh, you also have the shifted Hankel is positive. With shift, it just means that all of these, all of these couplings are shifted by one. And if, you're, if it's a doubly bounded problem, then you just twist it. By twisting, I just mean that you take the difference between each uh, consecutive uh, couplings and then you form a new Hankel. Good, so this, this as, so I've talked about this in amplitudes uh, this year. So this basically just built from this geometry and the product geometry just generalized these constraints. And this is what is carving out uh, uh, the, 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 the projective EFT space. So today I would like to now impose the con further constraint. And now I'm no longer just doing a moment, but actually I'm doing a moment where rho is bounded from above, uh, where it's bounded. So here, let's say this is L. Where L is going to be uh, basically two, or well, actually 32 to, uh, in our normalization. So the question is, what is the boundary of this, this kind of moment problem? So this is this in mathematical literature is called the L moment problem. And actually the solution was derived long ago. It was derived in 1934. And the statement is that if A is given in this form where rho is bounded from above, then the condition is that you put this A into this exponential form and you expand it out and you, there's two maps, therefore you can expand out in B and C. And the answer is just that the B and C satisfy various Henkel constraints. And these are the consistent condition that is required to impose on A. So B, these, when you expand it out in B and C, so of course B and C are just functions of A. So once you impose these condition, uh, then you get that uh, you, you then you get the solution space for a. So this is basically your solution. Now this is completely like out of the blue. I mean, why do I why am I looking at exponential? I mean, where did this come from? So uh, you can actually understand it very easily. So let me just do a very simple problem because this is very easy because this will show why doing exponential is is, me, is the solution. So now let, let me just consider the simplest version of this problem, which is a hamburger. By simplest, I just, I just mean that I'm not going to look at zero to one. I'm going to look at minus infinity to plus infinity. So in this case, so I'm going to look for this. So I, I want to ask what is the condition I can impose on A such that it has a solution of this form. So first, uh, as I mentioned, so we, we're going to use this exponential map and uh, expand it out. And the condition is that we're going to impose Hankel constraints on the B. So let's see why this will give you a solution. So first, if we impose a Hankel condition on B, that just means that B is written by as a convex hall of moments, where here rho tilde is just something that is positive because that's what Hankel's does. They just impose these projective constraints. So you know that B is in some convex hall of moments where rho is just positive. But you know that B takes this form. So then we just stick this into this, this B0, B1 here, uh, B0, B1 here. Then we see that this is actually an expansion of X minus YA, where YA are the elements in your hall here, so because this is just a series expansion, where you can put it in the polynomial form, uh, where you just put it in common denominators. And so each of these moments is going to appear as roots in your denominator. And your, the roots in your numerator is going to depend on what these row tilde is, but it's not important. So once you do this, then you can define a density now where the density is just one half L times the sine of this. So basically what this density does is that this is just going to be either L or zero uh, along the segments. Okay, so the, uh, between uh, the roots of here and the roots of the roots of the denominator and the roots of the numerator, uh, I'm just going to is the, the the density is just going to be a segment. So so if I write it out, so if I write something like d mu x minus mu rho mu, and then rho mu takes this form, then it's just going to equal to an integration of segments. Right for each segments, I just have a l x minus u, and you're just summing over segments. 
And since you're summing over segments, what you get is just, you're just gonna get log uh, x minus y1 uh, over uh, x minus y1 prime. And therefore you're gonna get L times log of this function, which is exactly this thing here. So we're at the end because I already said that, uh, so through this map, you can see that then these couplings are just given by L log of this function. But I already said that this function is equ equivalent to rho mu x minus mu here. Therefore, if I just expand x, then I get that, and then match both sides, I get that ak is given by d mu rho mu, where rho mu is given in this form. So I found a solution. Okay, so by, imp 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 by implementing uh, the Henkel constraints on B, I'm going to get a solution for A where rho mu now satisfy that it's either zero or L. Actually, it's, it's not between zero or L, it's actually either zero or L. So this is a solution uh, I get. So you can see why imposing, why do you want to have this exponential map? But the point is, I, I'm not going to, uh, uh, use this uh, condition, um, try to carve out the space. Actually, what I'm going to do is that the important thing is that this solution is actually necessary and sufficient condition. So all of this is really telling you that the space that you carve out by this condition is going to be parameterized by solutions whose density are just constants. Okay, so this is really the, 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 the so this is really the, 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 the the point I want to emphasize. So for the L moment problem, from this analysis, you can see that for the L moment problem, the space here for AK, the boundary of this space is just parameterized by constant segments from this analysis. And therefore, all you need to do is to find what uh, segments are there that are constant that maximize the problem that you're interested in. And so basically what we've solved is that we've identified what exactly are the segments here uh, that uh, actually solve the, 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 mo the, the L moment problem. So, uh, so let me just uh, flash you the, some explicit example that we just one explicit example that we did. So for, for example, uh, let's say we want to bound the coefficient B00, which will be R to the four, uh, and then the two coefficients for D square R to the four. And now I'm no longer interested in bounding their ratios. I just want to bound them absolutely uh, as a function of their, 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 their cutoff. So uh, I just use my dispersion relation. I write them out. Uh, I, I get this term. So these are dispersion relation coming from uh, S and U channel uh, contribution. And these are all bounded, all positive, but now we know that they're bounded above by two. Okay, so each of these are L moment problem. So first, we identify that the physical couplings are basically a Minkowski sum of two geometry, one from the S and one from the U. And one of the important facts from Minkowski sum is that the is that the convex hall of the Minkowski sum is equal to the con the sum Minkowski sum of the convex hall, which means in practice is that all you need to know is the boundary of the individual convex hall. Then by projection you can get the boundary of the sum. So instead of some, instead of dealing with the, 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 the sum directly, we can first solve for the boundary for the S and the U, and then just do projection, then we can get the boundary for B0, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So uh, the, the solution is actually very simple when we're considering just two couplings. So when, two, when let's consider just 2D for unequal K. So I guess I'm a little bit running out of time. So let me just briefly mention what the solution is. So for, for, for uh, unequal case, for example, A1, A0, which means that X is zero, K is zero and one. So the solution is just two segments, either one running from zero to M, some particular middle point, and the other is running from uh, some middle point to one. And for each spin, uh, you have a segment. So you have an infinite number of spins. So therefore you're doing an infinite number of Minkowski sum, for one for each, set, each spin. Uh, it turns out that these two segments, only this segment is relevant. And for each spin, once you sum all the spin together, each spin, the, the, this middle point where you, you, you start to differentiate, uh, you, you change to the other spin, uh, is actually related. Uh, so one spin is related to, uh, to the other. And so, we can, so we've solved this problem and we have the explicit form. And if 
if, so this so uh sorry i'm just gonna uh, go directly to the results so basically the, the punch lines that we've solved all the relevant segments uh that is saturating the boundaries and so then so this is the result so as I mentioned, it's the sum of two geometry. One is the S-channel geometry. The other is the U-channel geometry. So the S-channel geometry is just covered by, first you have the, like the polytope type uh, constraints, and then you have uh, the unequal K uh, constraints that are given here. And for the B geometry, uh, for the U-channel geometry, you have something that is exactly the same, but just slightly different. And then combining these two, uh, you can now project down to to the physical space so by doing this for example so we just use the k equals one constraint uh, uh k equals one null constraint then we get that b zero zero normalized by four pi square is now bounded by a number 0 0.639 uh yes so to, this is uh basically what we can do and of course given this we can now also bound uh so which is what we're doing we're working on right now which is we have the three dimension plot of the space uh which is not which is just normalized by the mass dimension uh sorry the the, the cutoff your team Okay, we lost him. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, no. Hi, Yuchen. Yeah. Hi, sorry uh, about Yeah. Okay. okay. Now you're back, but you have to share your slides again. And uh, you still have three minutes. Well, three minutes, including questions, I guess, if we follow the schedule. But uh, can you share your slides? Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sharing the wrong one. We, we don't, okay. it was perfect. Okay, yeah, so let me, let me, maybe let me just end here with, uh, with questions. Yeah, so, so we, now we have these un unprotected. So this is uh, once again, the, the coupling for R to the four uh, operator. Uh, which do our, or this is the cutoff scale, or the, the first uh, high, the first uh, mass that comes in in, in in the UV, and as expected that these are order one uh, coefficients. But the important point, of course, is that uh, now we have an exact number sitting here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Yutin, for a very beautiful talk. We have a few minutes, so I guess people from the audience. And first, go ahead. If there are any questions? And uh, yes, people from the chat also, you can raise your hand. Okay, maybe maybe I, I will. I will ask them. So, in in when when this uh, uh, this kind of extremal extremal uh, rows either zero or L. That sounds mm -hmm. like something which would would not pro produce a crossing symmetric amplitude, but I guess the, the idea is that you, you impose crossing at the very end. Yes, sorry. Yes, I I just mentioned by a sentence. Yes, so we first carve out. We first give the space. Yes, we first give the. For example, in here, if this was just a two D problem, if yeah. it, and you just have one channel contributing, this would be the space that you give uh, that you will get, and if you include higher and higher spin. What will happen is that the upper boundary will go up and the lower boundary will go like this. So then you get something that looks like this. And then you slice okay, this okay. the end, you slice this through with the with the, with the crossing plane, and then you have an intersection point which gives you the maximal value. And the related question. So in the context of this 2D moment problem, uh, 
or is this bound to us? Is, is there a statement on the analytic side that this set of con set of constraints is sufficient? So this is this is optimal. This is as good as you can can do. Uh, so right now we just we we propose uh, we 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 propose. Okay. Yeah, there's no, yeah, there's no, there's no, uh, we just have numerical evidence for what is sufficient and what is not. Yeah. And of course, the numerical evidence, uh, I think, is sometimes it's really reflecting the fact that uh, you have a crossing plane. And the crossing plane basically truncates the higher spin contribution, yeah. it suppresses it. And so, yeah, so numerical evidence, um, yeah, we, we should take it with a grain of salt. Okay, well, um... Ah, there is a question from Julio. Yeah, it's just a very simple question. Here you say in 2D, this is which 2D theory? Or Sorry, I mean 2D, what I mean is that the so so when we're when we're carving out the when we're talking when we're carving out the theory, uh, we're always sitting, we need to start with a non-trivial uh cup non-trivial number of coupling constants that we're we're carving out. So oh. 2D just means I'm choosing two couplings. So and then I'm carving out the, the, the space within this two coupling. Okay, so this is still four dimensional gravity. Yeah, this is four dimensional. Yeah, this is not space time dimension, right? So, for example, in the end, the, the, the car, the, the, what we're carving out uh, here is these three couplings. So, this is a three, for us, this would be a 3D space uh, associated with the one coupling that is, represents R to the four, and the other two is the two, two different uh, contribution for D, D square R to the four. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I think in view of time, we should go ahead. Let's thank you, Tina, again. And uh, our, our next speaker is uh, Aninda Sinha. So, hi, Aninda. Hi.